you always tell good news to your team. You don't share the bad news, even though you have no money left. Are you ready? Manufacturing is sexy. Sounds crazy? Just wait. I'm Z Holly, host of The Art of Manufacturing, your behind the scenes look at how people who make stuff are trying to make it in their industries. If you've ever wondered how to build a brand, a business, or just a better mousetrap, tune in and enjoy. Truck drivers can make $80,000 a year, but there's still a shortage of 50,000 of them in America, and the issue is only getting worse. Last week, we spoke about some pretty futuristic transportation ideas with Anita Sengupta of Hyperloop One. This week, we're talking about how to make transportation and logistics work better today. Lydia Yan is the founder and CEO of Next Trucking, a portal for matching shippers with carriers. Although Lydia isn't a manufacturer herself currently, her past entrepreneurial experiences made her realize how critical truck drivers are to the manufacturing and delivery of physical goods. Especially in today's world of complex supply chains and consumers that want instant gratification and products on demand. I was curious to learn more about how the shipping ecosystem works and how Lydia's software tries to make it better for everyone involved. Well, everyone except the brokers, maybe. I wanted to understand how autonomous vehicles and automation are playing a role in logistics. In particular, several tech companies have tried to automate the matching process, including Uber, but without a lot of success yet. So I wanted to understand the pitfalls and how Next Trucking has managed to be profitable so far. And I wanted to get Lydia's tips on logistics and shipping for emerging brands and manufacturers. We hear about that and a whole lot more on this week's episode of The Art of Manufacturing. I was born and raised up in Shanghai. I love Shanghai. Yeah. It's a beautiful city. Beautiful city. Which Yeah. Mm-hmm. I have uh, an apartment next to the bond. It's beautiful there. Yeah. yeah. Except the weather is a little bit challenging. Ah. Yeah. So when you moved from China, what was the biggest surprise when you moved to the U.S.? Well, I got a scholarship at UVA, University of Virginia. Because back then I had no idea what America looked like. I only know what New York looked like. So I applied for all the schools um, that ranked the top 50. And I got accepted by UVA. I was like, okay, that's the one of the best at public school, right? You applied for 50 schools. Yes, I did. Yeah. It was very <laughs> you're, expensive. You're an overachiever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I got several offers, but of course, UVA uh, was ranked the highest. Mm-hmm. And I got scholarship because back then, for a Chinese citizen to come over to school, you'd better have a scholarship or you wouldn't have a visa. Mm. So I came over, and the first surprise I got is it took me almost 24 hours to go to UVA because I flew to San Francisco first. I didn't expect that I would take another five hours flight to Washington, D.C., and I'd <laughs> hop onto another small flight. It's like 30 minutes to Charlottesville. And when I landed, I cried because <laughs> it was dark. There is, it's not a city. And uh, there's no like buildings. Like I was born in Shanghai, right? So a lot yeah. of high rise buildings, a lot of people. And I see, I didn't see any people. It's like, this is not America. So I cried. Oh. <laughs> that, that's the biggest <laughs> surprise. But I love the school. It's a beautiful campus. How and long did it take for you to fall in love with it? Three months. Yeah. Three month. Yeah. The first month was very challenging because I didn't speak English. It, it was bad. Like wow. I couldn't understand half of the class wow. because my English wasn't good. I thought it was good, right? But I, when I communicated with the professors, I feel like I can talk to her or him. And uh, when they talk to me back, I didn't understand what they were talking about. And I was a TA and teaching assistant, and I had to teach a class of 30 students. And it was very challenging back then, but uh, I got it over um, after three months in school. It's it's great experience. That's amazing. Yeah. So tell me about Next Trucking. Well, Next Trucking, we call ourselves the first trucker-centric marketplace where we connect direct shippers with small trucking companies, either on operator or small fleets with 226 trucks. We launched the apps back in October 2015, so a little bit over two years old. And uh, we're experiencing hyper growth. And December last year, we got founded by Sequoia, one of the best VCs in the world. And we're very lucky. So we're hiring right now. That's fantastic. Got that, listeners? (laughs) Yes. 
That's great. And so you said I noticed that you're the first trucker centric yes. company. So what does that mean? That means we built the software surrounding the truckers' needs. Mm -hmm. Because for our industry, 90% of trucking companies are small ones, either on operator or small fleets. They do not have software. They do not have visibility. They rely on brokers to find them loads via phone calls, text messages, emails, sometimes even fax. Very, very inefficient. A lot of back and forth negotiations. And also we have high turnover rate in the industry, 97%. Nobody wants to drive a truck anymore because they don't get paid that much. And it's a horrible lifestyle, especially for long-haul drivers. They're out of home nine months out of a year. And they do not have a lot of choices. For example, we have truckers who right now in Dallas, Texas, and he wanted to find a backhaul home. So what they typically do is they will call a bunch of brokers that they know trying to find a backhaul. But they don't necessarily find one because there's really no transparency. So they only had two options. Either they bobtail home, losing money, or they go to another location. They sacrifice the time to mm. spend with their family. So what we wanted to do is really to allow drivers to dictate what they want. They can tell the marketplace what where they wanted to go, when they will be available, and they get paid a fair market price. So they can really, we're putting them on the driving seats. And they have choices now. It sounds great. It seems like it makes a lot of sense. And at the same time, I've heard over the years of several companies, a lot of companies that are trying to do the same thing. Uh, Cargomatic is local. Mm -hmm. um, Convoy is one that got a lot of attention because of their celebrity investors. Yes. <laughs> and of course, Uber has been getting in the game as well. Yeah. And I think some of them are struggling, but you know, others don't seem to say one way or another. And so it seem, seems like it makes sense. So why are some of them struggling? And also, why do you feel like you're going to succeed in such a competitive marketplace? I think, first of all, our approach is different because we focus on the carriers, because we're carrier driven. And uh, we are from the industry because we understand what drivers need. And we build the product surrounding the drivers needs because our industry is short of truckers. And uh, this year, we are lack of at least 50,000 drivers. And the shortage of truckers is the number one problem. And we build great relationship with our carriers. We build lanes. So unlike some other startups, they go out, they acquire all the drivers they can possibly get while they couldn't give them loads, right? Because you need it's a marketplace. You need to grow the supply and demand simultaneously. So our approach is we start from California. We build capacity here. So California drivers' um, behavior is very similar, right? They go out, they come home. So we build round trips for them. Mm. And then we keep those drivers on those lanes. So it's easy job for them, very stable income. So people enjoy working with us. And the relationship we build with drivers is very different. You, We treat them as a part of us. We call them carrier partners instead of truck drivers, right? And so a carrier is the truck driver, the individual? Carrier or is, it a is the company? trucking companies, but okay. the trucking companies has uh, own operators. One guy owns his own truck and he drives himself. Or small fleets with multiple trucks. So usually they're the owner and the drivers who work for him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd love to take a step back, actually, and talk about the, the process and the terminology. Because I think a lot of the folks, I, I myself too, am not really that up on the terminology. So. Yeah. Intermodal transport. Is all of this intermodal or this doesn't even necessarily have to be? And what is intermodal? So trucking is an $800 billion industry. It's ginormous. So when we talk about an industry, like front industry, we usually divide it into five segments. Full truckload, less than a truckload. Drayage is from the port to a local warehouse. And the intermodal is from the train station to a local warehouse and small parcel. Mm. So right now, Next Trucking primarily focuses on full truckload, which mm. is the largest segment. It's $460 billion. Mm -hmm. And we are also exploring opportunities in LTL and the drayage because from the port, we're next to the largest port in the whole country. LA port itself has $12 billion outbound freight. So we do Last have I a checked, lot. Of it was 43% of all port traffic coming into the U.S. comes through the L.A., the combined yeah. ports. Yeah, a lot of things made in Asia come over to Long Beach and the L.A. port because um, it's closer and it's cheaper. So a lot of importers choose to go to the L.A. port. So we do have a lot of freight to move here. Mm. 
We have the full truck load. We have the partial. We have drayage, which is the Five port total. to mm-hmm. the to the warehouse. You got intermodal, which is the port to uh, it, the intermodal is from train station. The train station. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I for some reason I thought intermodal was any time you were moving it from one type of transport, just container containerized. Is that not right? No, oh. like we define it as from the train uh, to okay. the local now warehouse. Now I've learned something. <laughs> and then what's the fifth? Then small parcel. Small parcel. Oh, yeah. small parcel. Okay. Yeah. And I'm sure that all of this is just blowing up because everyone's expecting things shipped, especially oh, yeah. for the consumer. Yeah. They want something immediately. And at the same time, there's all this talk about how the autonomous vehicles are going to take mm-hmm. away all the jobs. So that probably has a bit of an impact on drivers as well. We spoke to most of the autonomous trucking companies, uh, Embark, Auto, um, there are big ones out there. But most of them I think they're still at early stage. It's pretty early and it will take a little bit time for them to really mature the, their technology. I think the biggest the hurdle will be the regulations because right now autonomous trucks can only be operated in Arizona and Florida. And uh, where we see uh, we can use uh, autonomous trucks is really over the road trucking, like for truck load, LTL, for long hauls. Because drivers... LTL? Yeah, LTL is less than a truckload. Oh, got it. Yeah, full truckload versus LTL. Got it. Yeah, but we're looking at long hauls. Because the reason why autonomous trucks can come in play is because drivers will be tired driving too many hours. Because right now, our drivers can drive up to 11 hours a day. And uh, especially for long haul drivers, if we can really bring in autonomous technology, it can relieve a lot of burden from them. But we don't really consider it as a challenge for us because we're talking to them. We consider them more like our partners because they're one of the carriers as well. And uh, we believe when they come out as like truly come out as a business, they can be one of our carriers covering the loads that you know, traditional truck drivers do not want to go or that we call tough lanes, right? Very long journey, long haul. And uh, we can put those trucks on those long hauls versus we can really increase the productivity for our drivers. Mm-hmm. And my understanding is it'll be a little bit, a little while longer before autonomous trucking. It's longer than people think from all that I've read yeah, because of a lot of other complexities. I don't know what those are. Yeah, I think five years for the technology, 10 years for the regulations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think it's the especially for trucking. Yeah, and because um, we have also insurance policies, a lot of things involved in between because it's not like a small vehicle, right? A truck can be really dangerous. Mm. So we really wanted to wait till the technology is mature, but we are actively talking to all of them. What is the process currently for the carriers? How do they learn about the jobs? So what is the competition for you, the existing incumbent technology that's being used? Is it technology? Mm -hmm. Well, right now, drivers rely on brokers, like people, to find them loads. There are brokerage companies that have thousands of employees making phone calls every day. So their job is essentially connect shippers with carriers. And what we're doing is really to replace these people with technology, giving more visibilities to the drivers. That's what we do differently because instead of negotiating back and forth with a broker, we actually allow drivers to dictate what they want. Then they can go to take a load when they are available instead of taking something we call force dispatching is really dispatching a driver to a location that is less preferred. I know I always feel bad when I'm in an Uber and I find out that I've made them go way in the other direction yeah. than I wanted to go. Yeah. I can't imagine that Uber, if Uber Freight is going to require the same thing, that's, that would just be unacceptable. That would be, that wouldn't be very pleasant <laughs> no, no. for the drivers. <laughs> no. Tell me a little bit more about what that relationship is like with the broker, because I think that there would be a a certain amount of trust that's been built up, is it going to be easy or hard to disrupt and disintermediate them? I don't think any carriers wanted to work with a broker because there's no transparency. There are a lot of under tables in the industry. That's why we say there's no transparency. Why does a broker give loads to you versus someone else, right? Mm. Because there might be under tables, there might be favoritisms. So what we wanted to do is really to get rid of the middleman. This situation reminds me of the challenge we have 
in manufacturing, trying to find contract manufacturers. There's been a lot of technologies that have come out to try to match entrepreneurs, designers, whoever, with You're existing right. manufacturing uh, resources, and they have not been successful for the most part. And I think a lot of it is that people do value the personal relationships, but they mm-hmm. and they also just you don't get the full information that you want from technology. You're right. It's not just it's not like an Uber where every driver is yeah. is the same. Mm-hmm. You really need something very specialized. You're right. Another thing that we do differently is we have a very strict vetting process. Mm-hmm. It's not like if you're a carrier, you can join our platform. We do a complete vetting. So we study their background and their history. They need to have a minimum of 100,000 cargo insurance. And also we have a review system. So mm-hmm. if drivers do not deliver or they drop the loads last minutes for three times, we actually blacklist them from mm. our system so we can really control the quality because we work with a lot of enterprise shippers who spend millions of dollars on shipping on a yearly basis. So we wanted to make sure that we provide them with the best quality service. And I think our ultimate goal is really to build a virtual fleet with the best drivers. Why can't Uber do this? I mean, they are doing it with passenger vehicles. There are a lot of companies who's trying to dive into our industry because they see it's a huge space. There are a lot of opportunities. It's extremely fragmented. But I think what make us unique is because we're from the industry. We're not really some tech guys trying to make some quick money in this huge industry. And uh, we really wanted to build something with a good cause. So tell us a little bit about that background. How did you come to where you are today? Well, uh, my family has been logistics for a long time, and uh, we operate one of the largest TV distribution centers in Southern California. So I did have first-hand observations and experience from the industry. So the biggest the issue I saw is really lack of transparency and the no technology. My family is supposed to be very tech-savvy already, but we were using some software that was developed 10 years ago. It looks like a DOS system, blue and black. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they use FTPs, you know, and EDI <laughs> exchange. So there's a little story back then. Um, one day I was on a freeway, I saw a truck parking at the emergency zone. And I asked my husband, I was like, why is he parking there? Isn't that dangerous? Isn't that illegal? And he thought oh, truck drivers couldn't afford to park at a truck stop. So he's taking a risk. I was like, that's 25, 30 bucks. And uh, they, this is a very noble job and they're moving loads so we can purchase things, right? And we need to do something for those guys because they're underpaid. They work so many hours. And this is just because there's no technology in our industry. And also I went to my family office. It's like we're we're a three PL company and everyone's on the phone. And the back and forth negotiations, people fighting and the drivers don't want to take this load and we will force them to take this load. And I remember one dispatcher spent almost two hours trying to cover one load. I was like, this is ridiculous. One person works eight hours a day. He can only cover four loads. If we can have visibilities, we can largely increase efficiency. Because right now, it's not because we are lack of drivers. It's really because 40% of capacity is wasted because drivers sitting there trying to find their ideal loads. Crazy. Are you a tech person? Is, it, is that where you where you came up with the idea? My background is e-commerce. I worked at a company called Newegg, and uh, it's a $2 billion e-commerce company, and I was their marketing officer. So I was managing their $20 million marketing budget. So I'm sort of a tech person. I worked mm-hmm. at a tech company, and I understand the data very well. I built the app and built a website. But of course, right now, we have a a very talented product engineering team, and I'm very proud of them. What was the hardest part about coming to where you are now? Do you, is the app working now? Is uh, it, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and how long has it been on the market? Two and a half years. Oh, it's been, okay. Yeah. So, And uh, what was the hardest part to bring that app to market and make it work right? Well, initially, it was very diff- difficult. Uh, we didn't have money. We didn't have a team. It was me and two more people. It was a very small company. and we, How were you funded? 
We okay. use our own money, family and friends, when we mm-hmm. started, and uh, we built the first prototype. I had to send my co-worker back to China because we couldn't afford local engineers. So he is still there right now leading our, because uh, we have two engineering team. We have one in LA and one in China. Uh, so we can rotate and operate 24 hours right now. It's pretty efficient. But uh, we create our first prototype in October 2015. So immediately after we got founded with a local incubator called Mucker, mm-hmm. um, based in Santa Monica. And uh, then it was quite a journey. We still couldn't afford the engineers. I remember we were working 12 hours, 14 hours, 16 hours a day. And I remember when I try to hire people, the first question I ask is always, can you wear multiple hats? <laughs> <laughs> because I remember I was doing customer service, I was doing billing, I was doing product management. And because I'm working with China, right, there's time difference. I feel like I was constantly working. Mm-hmm. In the daytime, working with the U.S. team, and at nighttime, working with the China team. And I need to switch language too. So sometimes I work so many hours, I, I forgot <laughs> the language. I spoke to my U.S. team in China. Chinese and talk to my China team in English. It was it was a quite an experience. Yeah. <laughs> but things are a little better now. You're growing. Yes, we're very happy. And uh, we're very lucky that we got Sequoia as a partner. They helped us a lot. And we recruited very talented product team, engineering team, marketing team, and the sales operations from the industries. So we have talents both from the logistics industry and the tech industry. What was the point at which you felt you were able to raise venture funding? Um, Was there a kind of a tipping point that made you attractive to them? Well, at the very beginning, I didn't know how to raise money. (laughs) <laughs> I, Next is not my first business. I had another business called Niluxie. It's an e-commerce company I had before, and it wasn't successful. It's not because we didn't know how to operate and know how to make money. It's because flash sale space was very cluttered back then, and a lot of competitors raised a lot of money. Even though we were profitable after six months, we got squeezed out. So I know it is important to have capital and have resources and have a right partner when we started Next Trucking. So that's a lesson I learned from my previous adventure. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went out to raise my first seat money, I didn't know any people in LA. So I literally linked in every single VC that I can possibly find on LinkedIn and trying to be connected. And how I got connected with my career is literally, I, we have no mutual friend except one. And I didn't really know this, that guy. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you're a founder and you're desperate, you did anything. So I went out and I just messaged this guy. I was like, can you make an intro? And he was kind enough to make an introduction for me. And I got my first meeting. And... Uh, after second meeting, we got our first check. It That's was great. the first, the best check that we got. <laughs> it got us started. That's amazing. So that, how much did you raise from Mucker? The Can first of check, it was like $120,000. Very, very small. But yeah. we were so happy. And because we did it, we only had a prototype and uh, we only had a PowerPoint. We didn't even have a team. And uh, they believed in our vision and that got us started. So that's why I told everybody, I was happy for two weeks. Like it was a big smile every single day for two weeks. Then we had to keep <laughs> yeah. the heads down and work. <laughs> had to deliver. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh-oh, now we actually have to deliver yeah. on this. Okay, so so before this, you were doing the family business and the, the logistics company. And before that was you were at Newegg. Yeah. Before that, you, were, you had your own company, Nine Lux, the yeah. flash sale e-commerce company before that what were you doing my first job was in at an ad agency so went out of so i graduated from usc and got a master's degree in communication management i couldn't find a job when i graduated because i was foreigner i needed a work visa and nobody wanted to sponsor me my english was still not up to the par (laughs) even as of today i still have oh it's amazing your english actually (laughs) is amazing (laughs) and uh, oh thank you and uh, so it was very very difficult i finally found a job at a local ad agency it's a multi-culture ad agency 
I got paid $38,000, but I was super happy because finally someone was willing to sponsor me. l e a r n a lot there, but I think I was a I'm not an entrepreneur, probably in the blood. So I wanted to do something. I always wanted to do something. So I started an apparel company. And it's a t shirt company called Grey Guts. It's literally very similar to American apparel, but it's the first adventure. I didn't have any experiences. It was a disaster. So I had my t shirts made in China. The quality is not good. When we ship it over, the sizes are everywhere. So that's the lesson that I learned is, you know, the reason why American p a r e l was so successful back then is because they had all their products designed and produced here. The price could be the same, actually, because with the import tax and everything, my price was pretty high. So that's what I learned is, you know, we can actually find resources locally as well. And、uh, this country can produce quality products as well. Great. So, The, that company was producing here,、um, originally started overseas and then moved here. And then with Nine Lux, you were manufacturing here and then exporting. Yes, yes. For Nine Lux,、um, it's a website in China. We actually represented quite a few contemporary brands in the US, a lot from LA. So we moved goods. LA made goods, the US made goods back to China. And it was popular. Like we were profitable after six months because people there loved American produced products. We need more of that. Yes,、But、we definitely we, need more than but that. But it was crowded. There's a lot of flash sale in, Cal- in、um, China. China is bloody. <laughs> the, mm-hmm. the, the, the startups were in China. Once they realize your business model works, you're going to have, you know. 500 copycats,、mm. and、uh, people are going to raise a lot of money. They will hack you. So it's a different market. I, I really like the market here. It's very transparent, it's fair. If you work hard, you deliver, people are going to recognize you. This is probably the real American dream. That's、uh, encouraging to hear. <laughs> and tell me a little bit about going back to the transportation, because、yes. I find it really fascinating. What technologies do you think? Are the most exciting to you in the future of transportation? The things that you think will also disrupt in a good way, make things better. What we are doing right now, other than disrupting the $800 billion trucking industry, we're developing end to end supply chain solution. So, all the way from ocean to drayage to warehousing to over the road trucking. So, shippers will have full visibility from A to Z. A supply chain can be very complicated from A to Z. Sometimes, from when it's manufactured to where it's delivered, it can take up to two months. And the shippers don't lost visibility at some point. So, what we wanted to do is really become a platform to link all the data points and provide the information to the shippers. So, that's what you're doing now. Next?、We're, that's what's coming up. Yes. And tell me a little bit more about how that works. So, right now, what you've been doing is this app that makes it Possible in a marketplace、yes. that, that's aimed at the truckers to enable them to create、yeah. or find the, the loads and the routes that they want. And、yeah. then,、um, so then when you take it to the next level, what might that scenario look like? So, we're partnering with different providers and mostly software companies in different segments of the supply chain. And we build a platform to retrieve data from them. And for Most shippers, we can provide multiple modes versus just the trucking.、Mm-hmm. So, we can do drayage, we can do warehousing, we can do ocean, we can do airport. So, everything in the supply chain. But for the shippers, what they can really increase efficiency because right now they probably, especially large shippers, they have a whole crew in house, lo- they call logistics team. They make phone calls to every single provider. Because you may have freight forwarders for ocean, you have warehousing providers for a warehouse, you have trucking providers. In order to get a trucking provider, you probably need to go through a broker. So there's so many layers of middle people in between. And the four shippers, they wanted to increase efficiency and save costs as well. Because right now, logistics cost almost accounts for 10% of their revenue. Versus 10 years ago, a lot of manufacturers and brands have a lot more profit margin. But because Because nowadays e commerce is very transparent because of Amazon and different e commerce players. So, vendors' margin is very transparent too. So, everyone's looking into logistics space and then realize that it's a huge 
market and industry, but lack of attention, lack of technology. Mm -hmm. So it's screaming for disruption. So I think we're definitely doing something right at the right time. I think a lot of people are interested in the space now. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. We all of a sudden we became cool get on the block. <laughs> <laughs> so you've mentioned three PL many times, and uh, I think many people know what that is. But but for those of the listeners who who don't, um, talk a little bit about what that role is and how they might interface with someone like you. Yeah, three PL we call it's third party logistics provider. Um, they usually have a warehouse, and they probably have some assets. If they don't, they're more like a broker. But most of 3PL companies are very traditional. A lot of information was really transferred manually or via email and a lot of paperwork. So what we wanted to do is really to streamline the whole process and make it digitalized. You're listening to The Art of Manufacturing. Follow our adventures on Instagram and Twitter at Art of MFG. And to chat with other like-minded creators, join the Art of Manufacturing Facebook group. We'll be right back after this break. I want to give a shout out to LegalZoom. They started out right here in LA with a belief it shouldn't be a frustrating or expensive experience to create a will, form a business, or apply for a trademark. So they started a movement to make legal help available to all. No confusing forms, no robots, just a straightforward online experience, transparent flat fee pricing, and the right people to help with all the details. In fact, Next Trucking is a customer. I'm especially a fan because they're supporting Make It in LA and our local businesses. Participants in the Catalyst program will get a complimentary legal kit and access to their business legal plan for a year. Super generous. If you want to learn more about the company, visit makeitinla.org slash LegalZoom. LegalZoom, where life meets legal. We're speaking with Lydia Yan, founder and CEO of Next Trucking. So if you would help an entrepreneur, a lot of the listeners are entrepreneurs who are manufacturing new goods, new brands. Those listeners who are just kind of getting off the ground and they're thinking about shipping their first product, what are the top three things that they need to know about getting their product to their final destination? Mm, that's a very good question. <laughs> I think... They should you work with next trucking. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an obvious answer, right? Um, depends on for what purpose, whether it's drop shipping, et cetera. But yeah. just for someone who really does not know anything about and had me started thinking about the logistics piece of it in general, who do they need to work with? What kind of relationships do they need to build? What terminology do they need? What are the first three things they need to do before they're ready to get their product out to the market? I think first is um, they need to really understand their product life cycle mm -hmm. and uh, production time and the shipping time because it can really cost them a lot of money if they are not clear about the shipping time. Just think about it. If you ship a truckload tomorrow is a lot more expensive than you schedule something later, like you give the trucking company time to prepare because it's very expensive to ship last minute load. Mm -hmm. Also really dig into what logistics is because it can be very expensive mm -hmm. and to find the right service provider who have good reputation like us and who can provide visibility. So you know where your merchandise is real time. What we can do is we can provide POD with a proof of delivery the moment the merchandise get delivered. Because if they go through a traditional broker, it might take two to four weeks to retrieve that piece of paper. Your merchandise could be sold already and they're in the you know buyer's warehouse. But without that piece of paper, you cannot bail them. With technology, they can really increase cash flow with us. Interesting. It sort of reminds me that where we are now with shipping and logistics reminds me of 1990. Nine, yes, 2000, the internet. Uh, I was at a startup. It was a search engine, and we were acquired by Ask Jeeves. And mm -hmm. people didn't realize that Ask Jeeves, whoever even has heard of Ask Jeeves at this point, but they did everything manually. Believe it or not, they had 360 recent graduates that would sit in front of the internet, and it was literally up to the people sitting in front of the computer 
finding the answers to those questions and anticipating those questions. Oh, my God. I mean, that's how small the Internet was back then. Mm -hmm. The fact that you could even. Yeah. Obviously, that doesn't scale. And that's why they needed to acquire a search engine. But I I almost feel like it's the same thing where you have these brokers that are doing everything by hand. And Mm -hmm. it just is not scalable. And everything is changing and scaling very fast right yeah. now. It's, um, we're talking industry is definitely still at the stone age. A lot of drivers are using phones still, like just text messages advanced for them. And for brokers... You mean so, like a landline? <laughs> <laughs> well, they have rotary? They have, no, flip phones. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <Ooh. laughs> a lot of them, um, it's because our driver's average age is over 50. Mm-hmm. A lot of them are still using uh, old flat phones and mm-hmm. we do give them phones if they need help and a lot of them don't even remember their app store password so mm-hmm. we had to help them set up the phone mm-hmm. but they're learning and they're yeah. definitely moving forward but uh, yes as you said the brokerage a lot of brokers are very very old school because there's really low barrier as long as you have a relationship with shipper you have a phone you can be a broker and mm-hmm. you can make money there and we have a lot of um minorities in trucking industry. We have a lot of Hispanic, Asian drivers. Um, Some of them are immigrants too. They probably don't speak English very well and they need a translator Mm -hmm. in between. So they get, you know, cuts from brokers, multiple brokers and translators. And, you know, that's why sometimes... A lot they, of middlemen. A lot of middlemen. That's why they don't make money. Mm. and But they do the most of the work and mm-hmm. they deserve a lot of respect. Yeah. I mean, and it sounds like the they're the backbone of the they're, commerce that's happening exactly. in this country and, and commerce is just continues to grow. Yes. And I, my understanding is that there is a huge driver shortage. Is that right? Yes. This year is it's going to be even more severe because we have an uh, electric lock device mandate. Uh, I think it was uh, finally forced in on April 1st, which means driver cannot drive over hours anymore. Oh, you, mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's going to change the market a lot because some of the drivers, they will stay local. So which means you will have even less Laho drivers. And a lot of small trucking companies are struggling because... They cannot find loads, even though there are tons of loads out there, but there's no visibility. And the price is low because there's so many different multiple layers of brokers in between. They do not make much money. So people are going out of business. So you will have, will have even more severe trucker shortage problem this mm. year. What about other technology trends in transportation? Do you think that things like Hyperloop or mm-hmm. drone delivery or things like that, are they – or any others that I might not have heard of that you think are worth keeping an eye on and are kind of interesting? Yeah, Hyperloop is definitely an interesting idea, but I just feel like it's very expensive to start with. And it's not that flexible as uh, a truck Mm -hmm. that you can go everywhere because it will be a set route for Hyperloop. Um, In terms of uh, drone, I think this is going to be really I, big. I actually yeah. wonder though, going back to the Hyperloop, is I, I wonder whether it creates more opportunities for you because the way, if I understand the way that you've ingratiated yourself to truckers is you're able to do shorter haul routes. Mm-hmm. And so they're able to stay at home. They don't have to go across the country. And by doing more of the in, across the country and long haul things in other ways, then maybe you can focus more of the trucking local. I don't know. Just a thought. Yeah, I think eventually it will be like that. Mm-hmm. For long hauls, probably put more autonomous trucks or Hyperloop on it. What's wrong with trains? Trains, well, I think it, trains is also limited by the um, first of the speed, mm-hmm. right? And also because everyone wants same day delivery right now. Mm-hmm. So speed is very, very important. So I think Intermodal will have less power later on, but um, trucking will still continue to grow. Because uh, it's more flexible, and once we have uh, more Thomas trucks in, we'll have more Thomas truck covering the long hauls, and the local drivers will haul the local ones, and it will be a lot more efficient. So drones, you think that that's interesting? I think it's interesting. I really like the drone technology, and I know a lot of tech companies put a lot of efforts in developing that, and uh, uh, Amazon's doing it. It will be the future, I think, for small parcels. But we still need to have long haul, like uh, local drivers to move truckload because it's different size of merchandise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Tell me about your 16-year-old self. I was I was a very good student. Yeah, I was pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> I was not the crazy kind. Um, I went to a high school called a Shanghai Foreign Language School. So it's very, very strict and it's limited. You have to the, be the best in your elementary school to go into. That's a seven-year school. Whoa. So it's like middle school plus high school. So I got the opportunity and I was lucky enough to be admitted to that. We call X-Men school. If you like it, everyone's very, very smart in that school. And uh, I worked a lot in school because everyone's smart. I, even though I was the, the best in my elementary school, I, I was pretty bad in um, those years. So I spent most of time in the library studying and uh, also took a weekend classes. So it wasn't that exciting. <laughs> Were you in the suburbs or in the city? It's in the city. And it's, you, in, and and it's a boarding school, actually. Oh, yeah, so I spent five days in school. And every Wednesday, your parents can come to visit you. <laughs> and, uh, and you get to go home over the weekend. And then I was always looking for the weekend. And uh, I, I got into that school when I was... Uh, 12 and because we're all the like only child because of the one child policy so we were pretty spoiled almost all of us i'm an only child too yeah <laughs> so, like, i never did laundry before i went to that school <laughs> so i remember the first semester the dorm was a disaster it was so dirty because nobody cleaned anything and uh, i remember it, our teacher had to walk into the dorm and say everybody clean the floor please it's disgusting <laughs> and uh, yeah it was it was fun and uh, i got opportunity to make a lot of good friends and we still stay in touch nowadays so you emigrated with your parents or how did that happen i came over for school oh that's right yeah but you said that your parents you, it's a family business that you have yes. here in la yeah they okay. came over too they followed you yeah i understand yes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think that she would have thought of you today um, I think they're pretty proud of me. <laughs> what do you think? But what do you think your 16 year old self would have thought of you? Would you would you be surprised that you're I a would be CEO? Surprised. I would be very surprised. I never thought I would be a CEO. And I would never imagine that I would be in trucking. <laughs> you know, it's like a legacy industry who wants to be in trucking, right? I because I always wanted to be in advertising, in media. That's why I went to USC and I got a degree in communications management because I wanted to be in media. I think it's fun and fancy. But uh, I'm really happy that where I am today because I'm solving real problems and helping real people. And when the drivers came into our office and shook out our hands and wanted to take a picture with us, it was amazing experience because we feel like we're doing something with a great cause and people appreciate it and the drivers say great things about us on social media we have those drivers go on facebook every day promoting for us we didn't pay them <laughs> so yeah that's that's amazing experience and also it's great to have a team that you know who believe in our vision who wanted to build something significant and also important to the industry we feel like this is awesome experience mm. yeah that is neat that you're you're doing something that really really matters yes <laughs> yes and what do you think has been the biggest growth experience for you as a ceo i think it's important to surround yourself with the people who believe in the vision and who are talented and who wanted to build something with a great cause versus just some people who wanted to, you know, just sit on the right, you know. This is important to have the right people. At the end of the day, it's the people who build the company. It's the vision that it drives us towards. Now, that sounds great <laughs> until maybe you hit a rocky patch and then people's vision is tested has there been times where hmm maybe the that that ideal yeah. was tested a little bit oh yeah i i'm not gonna tell you how many times i cried in a car by myself <laughs> i think most the startup founders did that if they didn't and they haven't had the real experience yet or they're extremely lucky or they're very good but yeah it was 
difficult. It was challenging, especially when we started. We didn't have money. We didn't have resources, and then it's very hard to acquire talents. And uh, so we spent a lot of time trying to convince people <laughs> to join us to believe in our vision, and we're very lucky that we got a group of people who took pay cut, who joined us, worked. Twelve, fourteen hours a Who day. Who are they? What, what, what got they're them excited? Superman. <laughs> yeah. They're Superman. They're um, Superman. I think they are the. Pe- we have people from the um, technology companies. We have people from trucking industries, because they see the real problem, right? And they understand what we are doing. So that's why we had the people with the right mentality. Even though we have very scarce resources to start with, we didn't raise a lot of money even till um, to the end of 2016. We raised. A total of one point two million dollars for the first year, and we delivered eleven million dollars in revenue. And we couldn't even get money from the bank because I was struggling every day for cash flow because we need to pay driver quicker because we need to take care of our carriers, right? And but we don't usually have thirty days terms with shippers, so I was constantly struggling with mm-hmm. cash flow, even though we have a lot of revenue and. Uh, for the first year company. I remember one time I had only $20,000 in my bank account. I was frustrated. <laughs> and uh, also I started to fundraising. And how many employees did you have at that time? I have like a handful, less than 20, like 10 or 12. But still, you only had 20,000 left. Yeah. Not much runway. Very, very, yeah. <laughs> no money. No runway. We had no <laughs> runway. And I started to fundraising for... Did you tell um, the team? No. You can never yeah. tell your team bad news, right? They of just course suck not. it up. <laughs> Being a CEO, I think this is the most challenging part is you always tell good news to your team. You don't share the bad news, even though you have no money left. And I started to raise... I remember for Series A, it took me almost four months to close that round because it's the first time to me. I never raised a really like a big round. And I didn't know a lot of early stage VCs. And I'm a Chinese girl <laughs> in trucking. It's not very persuasive to start with, even though we're very confident with our revenue and we were profitable. And we thought that it would be an easy round for us, but it took me four months and nobody wanted to fund us. And I was very frustrated. And uh, But uh, coming back to the office, I can only tell them that you know, I just uh, rejected another VC <laughs> instead right. of saying that, you know, another VC rejected me. Um, but at the end of the year, we were lucky enough to close a $5 million round uh, with China Equity Group. And uh, after that, we continue to work our butt off. Um, we had a 20-something people in-house and everyone's still wearing multiple hats because it's a high cash flow business, right? And uh, we also got a fantastic banking partner, Pacific Mercantile Bank. They're amazing. They're the first one that bet on us. Well, nobody believed in our vision. And uh, that kept us going. And we still worked many, many hours. <laughs> Everybody worked, you know, especially during peak seasons. I think everyone's lack of sleep. Hmm. But last round was easy because we delivered. We did $30 million in revenue. The company, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, and we were profitable. Mm-hmm. We're probably the only tech startup in trucking space that is profitable. We got multiple offers from Tier 1 VC. If you had one piece of advice for aspiring entrepreneurs or people that want to be pioneers in their space, something that you wish you had known when you got started, what would that be? Um, find the right angle, find the right market, find the right people. And you need to bring technology because this is modern world. The technology is a part of us. And for a lot of industries, it is still lack of technology. And for a lot of uh, owners, manufacturers, we have to embrace it because if we do not change, we're going to be changed by the industry. And another thing is be persistent. Do not give up. Because at the end of the day, your hard work will be recognized. Okay. You say be persistent. But you had a t-shirt company. Didn't really do that well. And you quit. Yes. And maybe that was the right thing. How do you know? When is it time to quit? That's what I learned from my previous experience. The t-shirt company, I didn't have the right market fit. 
I didn't have the right products. So this is important. You have to have the right products, and you have to know your market very well. I learned this from my first adventure, and the second night luxury is you need to have resources. I went off business not because I'm I was bad at operations. It was because I wasn't I didn't have enough funding. Mm. So that that's why this time we learned all the good lessons from the past, and we apply them to this venture. And we know we're doing something right. And we have the track record. And we have the right experiences and the right people. So the last thing that we need is to be persistent. <laughs> do not give up. <laughs> <laughs> and how many people do you have on your team right now? We have over 80. Yeah. yeah. That's great. How many of them are in L.A. and how many are in We have China? over 60. I think 65 in L.A. We have 20 in China. And where in L.A.? Uh, Linwood. It's not mm. the most... Uh, tech location yeah. but it's a center of logistics absolutely and a lot of drivers can see us um, uh, 105 freeway and we have a big logo on it and we put ourselves next to a warehouse so truck drivers can actually come in and talk to us yeah. versus you you know you put your office in santa monica or Venice beach truck drivers are not going to drive a truck <laughs> into your lot right you don't have a big open space and then you can offer some free you know rest stop and some coffee or something oh yeah and then, yeah, we yeah do. that's we a great get, idea our drivers get free t-shirt mugs hats um a lot of goodies from us and uh, our market Marketing team prepared very nice uh, little onboarding gifts for them. So oh. we want them to feel that they're valued, they're important, they're our partners. How do you find them? We didn't really do any marketing when we started. Even today, we did very little marketing. It's purely word of mouth. And uh, we have a lot of signups on our system right now. And uh, we have more than we can even onboard as of today because people talk good things about us. We have a lot of fantastic drivers who are our spokesperson without even marketing budget. And they, they spend most of time at truck stops. So people do talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the best of marketing for us. Do they still use CB radios? They do. <laughs> another yeah, one. some of them still use CB radio. A lot of them use text messages. But truck stops, people do talk. Yeah. Do any of them listen to podcasts? <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> Hello, truck drivers. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Did, is there anything I should have asked you? Um, I think that's it. Yeah. It's great. I, yeah, it's awesome. How can people learn more? You can email info at nexttrucking.com. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I'll go to our website and uh, send us a note. We have a team who can reply you within 24 hours. Do you do any social? Absolutely. We have Facebook. It's backslash next trucking. Twitter, next trucking. And also we have our LinkedIn handle. So, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I wish you the best of luck. You're definitely working on a very important problem. And Thank you. you seem to have a really interesting solution. And I love your approach and your attitude, the fact that you're very much supportive of the truckers and the drivers because they're they really are the backbone of it. So Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming. It was a lot of fun to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. My three takeaways from our conversation are first, for an emerging manufacturer or brand, thinking through logistics is really important. Consider shipping time in your process, find the right service provider, and make sure you have full transparency so you get paid as quickly as possible. Also, according to Lydia, 40% of trucking capacity is wasted. That's a huge amount, especially given there's a massive carrier shortage and demand keeps growing. I like that our portal enables truckers to make the most out of their trips, both from an environmental standpoint and a human potential standpoint, not to mention efficiency and cost. And finally, there's been quite a lot of talk about automation replacing jobs, especially truckers. But I think that brokers are the ones that need to worry. Anyone who doesn't provide a lot of value in the ecosystem will be disrupted. I do wonder how new transportation technologies like Hyperloop and autonomous vehicles will play a role. I think that along with consumers' insatiable desire for on-demand delivery, these trends might create many more opportunities for short-haul trucking in the future. But I also wonder if distributed and localized manufacturing could start having the opposite effect. Anything to reduce the need to move goods is better for efficiency, resilience, and the environment. Never mind on-demand delivery. How about on-demand localized manufacturing? 
Time to wrap it up for the art of manufacturing. Tune in next Thursday when we speak with Tim O'Reilly, founder of O'Reilly Media and author of WTF, What's the Future? With all of these seismic changes happening in business and technology today, I thought it would be fun taking a step back to explore where it's all going with one of the most respected futurists around. For show notes, visit www.artofmfg.com. Follow our adventures on Instagram and Twitter at Art of MFG. And to chat with other like-minded creators, join the Art of Manufacturing Facebook group. Never miss an episode. Subscribe on iTunes or Spotify or your favorite player. And if you like the show, do us a favor and leave us a review. Or send us a message with your thoughts and ideas to feedback at artofmfg.com. This podcast is produced by At Large and Dangerous in collaboration with Make It in LA and other partners. Visit makeitinla.org slash connect to sign up for local LA events and news. A big shout out to Peter Brandenburg, the producer and audio engineer. Thanks for listening to The Art of Manufacturing. I'm Z Holly, and remember, don't just make it, make it.